Role-playing games are pretty sweet. Taking on the mantle of a hero can be a blast that plenty of games allow. But as someone who's pretty seasoned in this form of entertainment, I've wanted more of a stronger kick, if you will. Ideally, I'm the one doing the kicking. What if you're looking for a different role to perform? Some let you put down the white hat and don a darker shade, doing some vile stuff, which on paper sounds exactly what I would be looking for, right? But here's where that turns into a complicated request. I want to play an evil character with nuance. My favorite villains are the ones who have an understandable reason for their wickedness. Everyone is the hero of their own story, and in their eyes, their cruelty is seen as their best option. The type of antagonist that once you understand them, you may not agree with the conclusion they reached, but you can see how they got there. And characters that are evil for the sake of it can be great too. If everyone was the former, that could get really boring. It's that understandable evil that I wanted to explore in role-playing. I've done it before, playing a character that was basically Dr. Peace from No More Heroes on the Tabletop. But in video games, that was a part I desperately wanted to play. Sadly, there aren't a lot of games that can satisfy that particular desire. In a lot of RPGs, the concept of morality can be odd. Ethics in the world are often represented by a bar leaning towards good or evil. Acting a particular way will have you perceived as that. But there are a couple of reasons that this approach doesn't work for me. That can be broken down in three main points. The first is how most approaches to evil are the murder-hobo-chaotic-stupid kind, needless cruelty without thought or consequences. Like killing a bunch of innocent civilians because Lamau, or a psychopath who tramples over anyone in the pursuit of power. With games that can make a good playthrough nuanced and interesting, like Knights of the Old Republic 2, it can be a shame when evil is portrayed the same cartoonish way constantly. Like if I wanted to play a clever fella, like the Chamberlain from the Dark Crystal, you know, the vulture looking dude who goes hmm. Mm. A schemer who tries to get everyone fighting amongst themselves before swooping in at the last moment? I'm out of luck. My choices for being evil are saying something passive-aggressive, or just being straightforwardly aggressive in public. And thinking that those are the only two options for being evil are nuts. That would be like saying the only way to be good is to be the epitome of a saint. That's insane. Another is how, by trying to gamify morality, it chucks realism out the window. One of my favorite bits of role-playing games is getting immersed in its setting and trying to pick choices that make sense within the game's context. By making your moral character shown as a bar, it makes morality feel artificial and not treating the setting like a real, tangible place the game is trying to create. Making progress on either side of the bar gives perks or abilities specific to it, so you may just play the one you think looks cooler like I did in Fable. Or because you filled the bar one way, you might just stay consistent and keep going with what you're doing, regardless of what you think at the moment. That morality bar doesn't offer rewards for mixing the two into whatever seems appropriate for your character but rather rewards extreme commitment to one side or the other. And the final is how when RPGs build the game around morality, it favors you for being the good guy. Sticking to the idealistic, well-intentioned path often leads to more satisfying quest resolutions, your companions liking you more, and may even lead to the game's true ending. I've got a question for you, and be honest with your answer. When faced with a moral choice, which one do you lean towards? The pragmatic option that's hard in the moment, but might be good down the line, or the good aligned choice that a party member advocates for? When taking into account the game's setting, it can be really frustrating to suffer no consequences for picking the impractical option that sounds good, where having good intentions automatically means it's the best option, and then having the game reward you for doing it with no downsides is a peeve of mine. But I see it like this. Morality is a very complicated and interesting topic. What is good for one won't be the same for another. For a choice to feel heroic or good, there should be a consequence for it, big or small. Because much like in real life, having good intentions does not guarantee a good result. And what may seem nice in the moment can lead to worse fates in the future if you're not careful. But if you take the game seriously, choose to push back against the evils of the world, there should be a trade-off. Maybe it results in an inconvenience for the player, removing an important resource, or requires some extra steps to do it correctly. Because in that adversity of what you're put up against, that strength of will is what makes your character a hero. Not because they let the quest giver keep their gold after looting a bandit stronghold, and not because they were indifferent to an option to be cruel, but because they chose to be good and endured its punishments when it was easier to walk away. And it's that lack of consequence, of making good so easy, it's meaningless and evil with a cartoonish attitude that kind of bums me out about morality in RPGs. And before I continue, I want to mention there are certainly sick games that pull this off well. Even some RPGs that don't have morality systems, yet pose moral conundrums that are interesting. But there's one title in particular that feels like it was made with all my whinging in mind. 
one that offers the player the option of making whatever kind of evil character they dreamed of crafting, and one that does so many things I've wanted a role-playing game to do. That game is Tyranny, created by Obsidian Entertainment. The fight between good and evil is over, and evil is won. Glory to Kairos. After a bloody 400-year campaign to take the world of Teridus, the overlord Kairos has one hurdle before total conquest. A small peninsula called the Tears is home to the Last Rebellion. The two armies fighting against this obstacle are the Disfavored, led by Graven Ash, the Archon of War, and the Scarlet Chorus, kept in line by the Archon of Secrets, the Voices of Narat. The two have been butting heads and are at an impasse. It is in this turmoil that the player takes the role of a Fatebinder, a servant of the Archon of Justice, Tunan the Abjunicator, to oversee conflict and bring order to Kairos' name. But this won't be accomplished by appealing to everyone's better natures. Oh no, it's not that kind of game. As a Fatebinder, you have a unique position to voice the Edicts of Kairos. Commandments that can inflict catastrophes across the land, eternal nights, raging storms, earthquakes, etc. But these decrees are worded in such a way that there is a condition for them to be removed, such as the edict you read in front of both Archons in the game's first act. The Overlord has decreed that all in the valley on Kairos' Day of Swords shall die, unless Kairos' representative holds Ascension Hall. Incentivized by Kairos' decree, you now need to crush the rebellion, or the edict prevails. It's in that premise that highlights what makes Tyranny such an interesting game. You are asked to participate and engage with this setting that is unique compared to other RPGs. Not just by being on the villain's side, but allowing you to participate in history before the game properly begins. And to explain that, I want you to think about some RPGs where you create your own character. I've noticed that when games let you do this, they may offer a generalized backstory that you have to make work in your head rather than confirmed in the game, or a tag system that gives you character options based on race, class, background, that kind of stuff. Was the game you're thinking about doing something similar? It's a practical idea. After all, allowing the character to flesh out their backstory sounds like it would be a bunch of work and could take away from other aspects. But the idea sounds pretty cool, right? Well, dear viewer, happy surprise anniversary or whatever pleasant good tidings float your boat, because Tyranny does that and lets you form more depth with your character. When you customize your Fate Binder, after picking a background of how you join Kairos' army, you have the option to play through the Conquest section. Think of it like a text adventure that shapes your personal involvement through the tiers over a three-year period. The choices you make in Conquest will ripple throughout the game. It makes certain figures or factions respond positively or negatively to you before even putting a foot on the ground, and even gives you unique skills for your character. But it also accomplishes the insanely difficult act of making your character, and thus you, feel like a tangible part of its history. Here's an example. For my playthrough, I made the character Roderick, a soldier who was swooped up by Tunan before pledging to the Disfavored. While I considered playing the Chamberlain in his entirety, I decided to instead play a warrior-type character who was as cunning behind the scenes. He believed in the goal Kairos aspired for and was willing to get his hands dirty to achieve it. Throughout the course of my game, I did some really shady stuff to guarantee that domination. One of those choices would follow my character across the tiers. During the second year of the conquest, after claiming the Bastard City, Roderick traveled to the mountain realm of Apex and led battle with the two armies against the Vendrian Guard. Near the end of the campaign, the land's queen agreed to peace talks, willing to negotiate with a Fatebinder of Tunan. There were two options. One would have Roderick spend days in meditation, using rhetoric to put an end to the bloodshed with a mutual agreement. That wasn't the option I chose. The second was more… cruel. During the talks, Roderick would taunt the queen a well-placed insult that would get her to attack under this banner of a truce and initiate a duel in self-defense, resulting in her death and scaring the vassals into Kairos' hands. What I did was horrible. It was cruel and just plain terrible. Yet I wasn't punished for that dishonorable act. In fact, I was rewarded for it. The Disfavored respected my choice as it prevented more casualties in the war, and throughout the tears, word would spread about the Fatebinder who bore the title Queen Slayer. 
a name that was both a gift and a curse of the playthrough, locking me out of a possible root of the game because I committed a cardinal sin to the people living there. The last year of your conquest has you reading an edict to one of the lands you'll eventually visit, and when you arrive, you feel a personal connection to it because you're the one who caused it. Lorne video games can be pretty sweet, hearing the stories or songs passed down from characters or other players. However, while Tyranny does have that in part, it instead uses these big events like Edicts or Conquering the Tears as the prelude to show the tangible effect your character has in this campaign, which in turn makes your Fate Binder not just another blank slate, but an active member in the story. It's a great option for roleplaying that I love tremendously. If that doesn't sound like your thing, you can skip the process if you wish. Though if you're up for a suggestion, I recommend trying it if you decide to check the game out. Besides getting you involved in the story, it also acts as a warm-up to the experience. Because through the conquest, you will be making some pretty tough decisions. War is complicated, and how to best approach it will vary depending on the key players. Most decisions will have you picking a Scarlet Course or Disfavored Aligned Action, and no matter which you pick, there will be consequences. Because of this presentation as options on a strategy table rather than in person, it's pretty easy to disassociate from the personal aspect of a choice to a more pragmatic one. It's effortless to be callous when you don't look the victims in the eyes. In one choice, members of the Scarlet Corps stole supplies from Disfavored. I demanded the latter share their food to a fellow army of Kairos, but the guilty would lose a hand as punishment. The Conquest board is a tone setter for sure. It looks like my character won't be the hero. What a shame. A real bummer. Such a disastrous turn of events. Anyway, what's more interesting is your role as a fate binder. With Tunon's blessing, you are an agent of Kairos' law, which may sound kind of whack, but that's because you need to think about it in the big picture here. By acting as Kairos' voice, you are placed in a position of authority, one that if you know how to handle it can be your greatest asset. In the developer diaries for the game, the lead designer had a really good way of describing the position, we figured if we're gonna put you loose in this world of evil, we might as well make you one of the corrupt cops. This position is fascinating, because you're not comically evil for the sake of it. You could if you wanted to be, that could be a fun time. But for those who want a practical take on playing an intelligent type of evil character, this is the part for you. Your actions will be closely monitored by the other fate binders and the tiers as a whole. Yet in this position, a ruling can be decided by how you spin it. Besides your conquest in the lands, you may come across arguments from others or be issued by Tunon to make a ruling of a case. These conversations showcase the quality of the game's writing, offering various interpretations to a situation, and if you have a high enough lore skill, you can be shrewd in Kairos' law and find technicalities for rulings. One that Tunon will accept because your answer was not straightforwardly kind, but instead practical in the Logos. I once got a Forge Apprentice off the hook from using Forbidden Magic because the law states it's broken when someone intentionally subverts it not due to ignorance, and that ignorance is what saved them. Your position as a Fatebinder is what allows a vehicle to be evil in whatever way you interpret, whether straightforwardly or complex, with moments of mercy that may lead to a greater whole. In fact, there's a whole route of the game where you give both armies the bird and rebel against your station, which could be as straightforwardly good aligned as you wish, or taking a different approach and conquering the tears in your own way. I can't speak with experience on the quality of the routes above, but it is an option if you're interested. Now feels like a great time to dive into detail about the armies of the Scarlet Course and the Disfavored, as they're the factions you'll be spending a good chunk of time with. The former can get pretty rowdy, so let's start with them. At first glance, the Scarlet Chorus is an uncontrollable fury. Their strongest aspect is their numbers. Those defeated by the Chorus are given the simple choice to serve or die, and if you choose to live, you'll be tasked with killing another to prove your worth. What makes the Scarlet Chorus so fascinating is while they're nowhere near as disciplined as the Disfavored, it's their numbers and how that incentivizes their troops. The Scarlet Chorus is made up of multiple cultures, the very same people Kairos has hurt, and by taking them in, the victims wash their hands of former identities and allegiances. It doesn't matter who you were anymore, but rather, what your voice can add to the chorus. Of course, this doesn't always work out. You'll hear from others that conscripts will run away, and because there's so many, it's impossible to keep an eye on everyone. So here's the other interesting part. As mentioned in the short story under new management on the Tyranny website, link in the description if you'd like to check it out. The Scarlet Chorus can thrive on how its group keeps each other in line. 
If a mission is a failure, it's because the boss wasn't strong enough to lead, and the underlings might just band together, kill their boss, and promote a replacement. Using that desire for power, the members of the chorus participate in a self-correcting system, celebrating what works and punishing those who don't. With new blood entering all the time, it's a system that keeps churning out members and shifting dynamics. A friend one day could be a corpse or a knife in your back the next. The chorus have a unique comfort with violence, they're raiders, and the constant exposure to the worst things humans can do has made them numb to it. In Act 1, you can duel to the death to release a prisoner, and everyone will think that's a great idea, even the poor guy who's going to end up in the dirt. When the fight's over, everyone returns to their post, like a group of friends walking home from a movie, and no one complains or laments the outcome. That's just how things work with them. Varys, the first companion you get in the game, is an interesting representative for the faction. She's a high-ranking member of the Order, comfortable with killing, but there's also a very practical logic she follows for decisions. Whoever has the most is the boss, and when they slip, it's time for new employment. The Scarlet Chorus keeps itself in check, as structured by the voices of Narat. The Archon of Secrets is mysterious. What a surprise. They're centuries old and donned in this multi-faced mask. They talk in we's and not I. There's a suggestion that the Voices of Narat is not one person, but rather multiple, all in the same head. A quote from another of the short stories, the Archon's voice, Narat says to another, A rare opportunity lies before you. Join us in our howling madness. Convince us of your worth by stripping away all pretense of self and become one of our voices. They specialize in interrogating for information, only doing so for special cases like important figures or mages, and no one sees what transpires in their tent, but they sure hear the screams from across the camp, as the Archon delights in a new piece of information. The voices of Narat are not your friends, even if you side with the chorus. They're one of the oldest beings alive, and they seem to be on the verge of madness. There's also a cool gameplay touch that highlights their scheming nature. When engaging in the game's conversations, there will be terms that you can highlight for extra info. If you ever highlight the green text when Narat is mentioned, a message will be spoken mentally to your fate binder rather than giving info. And if you decide to hunt down the voices of Narat in your playthrough and bring Varys along, they won't be upset, but rather proud of the wretched girl. In their words, in complete sincerity, she's everything the chorus strives to be. But this army is only one side of the coin. Let's contrast that with the disfavored. Where the chorus is wild, the disfavored is disciplined. Warriors trained in the north. This army is a quality over quantity type, often decked out in high-grade armors created by masters of the forge. What they lack in numbers, they make up for in potential. Their rigorous training sets high expectations that they are sure to match. The disfavored have an undying loyalty to their commander and Archon of War, Graven Ash. While the voices of Narat dances on the precipice of madness and is feared for it, Ash is deeply loved by the Legion, and he cherishes them all the same. The army's reputation is placed because Graven Ash is known to handpick his soldiers. Such was the case with another one of your companions, Beric, a man trapped in a suit of armor after the disastrous Edict of Storms was read where he was stationed. I don't think we need to look into who would have done something so horrible to someone they met on a daily basis that could ruin a relationship there. In one of the short stories, Graven Ash talks to a lamenting Beric after slaying a friend in attorney and ends with him saying, Arise, son of the north. You are welcome to join my disfavored legion, if you will have us. Graven sets a high expectation of his soldiers because each one is like a son or daughter. He's famed for his Aegis ability, a shield that protects his children from fatigue and injury, no matter how far he is, even when asleep. Yet that power is not always enough. If you get to know the Archon of War, you'll notice he carries a deep sorrow for the deaths of his children in the war effort, yet he soldiers on in Kairos' name. Out of the two, Ash is a much more understandable leader. In fact, the reason he serves Kairos was to protect the lives of his soldiers. Duty to his followers meant so much, he swallowed his pride and bowed to the boots of the Conqueror for their safety. The disfavored aren't about needless cruelty, they focus on doing what's needed to be done as swiftly as possible. Honor is a very selective thing in their eyes and they'll get their hands dirty for victory. Yet while they're a force to be reckoned with, they're not perfect. You can talk to the disfavored, and some confide that they're stretched way too thin, even with the Archon's ability, pushed to standards they can't always match and are not at their best for it. 
In Act 1, two-thirds of the disfavored forces are separated from where the edict is performed, cutting them off, reducing their small numbers even further. Also, an interesting piece of info, most of the army is illiterate, the written word is not seen as a worthy skill to distract from their training, and formal marriages aren't allowed. Yet soldiers are allowed to go on leave to sire children, to make a pure gene pool of the north. That's some weird trivia, right? But I highlight that and have gone to detail about both armies because tyranny nails its setting. The dedication to crafting these two forces shows the caliber of its writing. The two armies are more interesting and complex than just the purple army and the red one. For faction conflicts to be engaging, there needs to be an understanding of how they see the world, and by siding with them, what that says about the player character. Actions speak louder than words, and whoever you choose to side with despite their weaknesses can say more about the character you roleplay than any dialogue choice will. Okay, so that's a lot of the narrative aspects you can expect from Tyranny. Let's get into the game part of the roleplaying game. Tyranny is a CRPG, or a computer roleplaying game for those unaware, similar to titles like Divinity Original Sin, Baldur's Gate, or Pillars of Eternity. For a very general idea, think overhead camera, real-time combat you can pause and issue abilities, able to control party formations, that kind of stuff. Mechanically, once I started to get a better grasp of this style of play, I enjoyed the combat. The animations felt impactful, and I felt mostly in control of my party. I was more interested in the narrative aspects, but I had fun with this. Though hitboxes in this game are rough, especially with traps. Sometimes my party would notice a hazard, and if they were an arm or so away, the game would issue damage as if I stepped in it. That was whack, especially when a group of enemies would charge us after one dealt a good chunk of damage to my tank. The game heavily focuses on humanoid enemies, such as the inhabitants of the tears or ghosts called Bane and Beasts. You're not fighting the monster manual in this one. But this game has a couple of interesting ideas to it as well, combining its narrative elements with its combat. The first is magic. Tyranny has a spellcrafting system. As you explore the world, you'll come across sigils of the Archons that can be tweaked with expressions and accents, changing their effects or making them stronger. An illusion sigil that could make a subject a blur in combat can be changed into one that tricks people into thinking they're falling to their deaths. And if your lore skill is high enough, you could add multiple accents to a spell, making it even stronger. How well a character can use a spell is based on their lore skill, but even characters with other talents can dabble if interested. And then, there's the system that blends your character's morality in a way that feels really interesting. The game will chart your reputation with factions and important characters of the tiers by two bars, favor and wrath. It seems like a morality bar, but it's got a unique foundation. The perspective of your character will vary with different groups. Some will love you and others will curse you on their deathbeds. It's impossible to be loved by all. But when you reach a certain threshold, you'll be given abilities. It's how you're perceived that will grant you powers to aid your conquest. This can be achieved by being seen as good or evil by one perspective, making either feel like a reward. Rather than having a bar that shows your overall morality, by making it depending on the group or person, it makes it feel more nuanced. You can be both beloved by the people of Lethian's Crossing and a monster to the mercenary band trying to claim it. My character was hated so much by one group that I got a skill that drained the strength of enemies, making them ineffective against the evil before them, adding an additional tool in my arsenal. And Tyranny doesn't have classes, it's more of a freeform system where you pick what kind of skills you want to specialize in. The more you perform them, the better you get. And there's a couple of skill trees that allow some freedom in your character builds. I really enjoy warrior play styles, so I spec points into the power tree while wielding a greatsword, focusing on lowering enemies' armor and doing crowd damage with my cleave ability. Your allies also have skill trees, though not as many as the Fate Binder, so you can have them specialize in whatever role they fill. I highly recommend balancing your team to fit whatever playstyle you're going for, but I'm not your dad, so do as you please. Your allies can also perform combo abilities with your character. It requires both to charge, but can lead to some pretty cool looking and useful actions, like Varus tripping an enemy and your character pummeling them in the ground, or calling for Barrack to taunt with 100% accuracy. It adds to your character being the group's leader, and their word being law, issuing commands that they are bound to follow. However, that idea is undermined occasionally, as your companions will have a mind of their own. Even after setting the party AI, some spellcasters would run into combat, which is pretty annoying, and will often delay the action you want them to do in a heated battle. And here's another interesting bit that differs from other RPGs. Your companions aren't your friends. Each is serving you for their own best interest, or to prevent them from dying at your hand. 
Your allies may even hate each other, taking all their willpower not to stick a blade in the other's back. All companions will have reputation bars like the other groups or characters, except theirs are labeled loyalty and fear. That difference is very telling. Companions will chime in with their inputs, but each time risks the wrath of the Fatebinder, and both bars are not mutually exclusive. Your party can both be inspired by and afraid of you. That's an uncomfortable but interesting position to be in as a main character. In most games, they would be your best friends, willing to fight to the ends of the earth and back in the name of camaraderie. In Tyranny, your allies of circumstance. Nothing more. The nicest thing Varys ever said about my character with high loyalty was, I've had worse bosses, and I suppose I've had better friends. Thanks, Varys. You really make me feel something in the empty chasm where my heart should be. At this time, I now feel it appropriate to talk about the top brass, the head honcho, gazing upon all this, well, tyranny. Kairos. The Overlord is rather interesting. Much like the voices of Narat, there is a mystery surrounding them. No one knows what they look like. Some describe them as a man, others a woman, and the most interesting is how often they're named, declared in battle cries and edicts. They're more like a concept than an actual person. You'll never meet the Overlord, but the game will paint an intriguing picture about them. As the game goes along, you can correspond with another Fatebinder named Myothis. She's been around Tunan's court for a while, and will be an important ally, if you mind your P's and Q's when writing to her. What the Fatebinder offers is interpretations, compelling stuff when dealing with a concept like the all-powerful Overlord. One is the suggestion that their edicts could be more powerful than Kairos themselves. Much like how your party can interact with sigils of the Archons and your Fatebinder with the towering spires across the tiers, there's a suggestion that it's more the idea of Kairos as an omnipresent force that's a threat rather than as a person, and their power came from something they found at the right place at the right time. This suggestion draws a comparison with your Fatebinder. Many of your peers have proclaimed and broken edicts before, often having a shorter lifespan because of it. Yet you're a special case because you proclaimed and broke the same edict, in addition to the one you read during the conquest section. Much like this speculated Kairos, your placement in the world has aligned with powers much older than you, and the future will vary depending on how you use them. Fatebinder Myothis is great. Your only interactions with her are through letters, but they get you to think critically about the game's concepts. What are edicts truly? Why does Kairos have termination clause written in them? What are the Archons, and what does that mean for you? Not the player, but your character. Well, I love to share what my character Roderick came up with, but to do that, I will be spoiling the ending of Tyranny. If you'd like to avoid spoilers, you have my blessing to exit out of this video. Come back whenever you're curious or it sounds entertaining. I'll be here. For those nefarious viewers who want to stick around, good to have you. Let's do this. Tyranny is about power, and the game is an exploration of what it means to wield such a force, in a position where eyes are thrust upon you, whether you like it or not. But it's also one that has you grow a sense of paranoia for your character. As Fatebinder Myothis writes, as you've been gathering power, it's only a matter of time when forces deal with you before you reach untouchable heights. She offers you this advice, think and act like an Archon. And that saying got me curious about a book. For those who partake in literature, you may know the one I'm about to mention. A book about power dynamics, and often featured by famous people in banned and prison libraries. A tome you may now recognize and have you going, oh no, at the screen. Oh yes, dear viewer, it's time for the 48 Laws of Power. Originally released in 1998, the book was written by Robert Greene, and as he states in this video explaining it, its purpose is to educate readers to recognize power dynamics and defend against such things. But I'm going to apply the theory, the author is dead, completely disregarding its original purpose, and use the book as an instruction manual for Roderick to achieve power. Throughout the playthrough, there were two constant laws that were employed. Law 3, conceal your intentions, and Law 11, keep people dependent. My version of the Fatebinder allied with the Disfavored and would offer a sword for whatever cause they needed, and while he would parrot the Disfavored's good word, he wouldn't go into specifics of why he was doing it. You see, the Abjunicator Tunon had tasked him with finding dirt on both armies to figure out who was at fault for their conflict, and imagine what would be told to a friend and not an enemy. So he played the part. He won the loyalty of the Disfavored and Graven Ash. 
Of course, there were some contradictions along the way. The Fate Binder was a person, not a machine. Law 26, keep your hands clean, was doomed from the start with my character concept, and recalling what Roderick did at the end of the Edict of Storms was a prime example. Let's not talk about that, but it all came to a head in the game's final act. The Fatebinder's powers with the Spires was growing, able to make copies of Kairos' edicts, and with the conquest reaching its end, the Overlord made two proclamations. The Tears only needed one Archon. They can agree upon which one it is, either with words or with blades. And the last, your character has been promoted. How does Archon sound? You are now placed in a greater position of power. However, a target is mounted on your back, and all someone needs to do is strike. So Roderick first dealt with the Scarlet Chorus. The makeshift edicts scattered their forces, giving the perfect opportunity to defeat the voices of Narat. Then the Disfavored, which offered one of the most satisfying roleplay encounters in the game. Graven Ash and I argued about who should be in charge. My favor with the Archon of War won knowledge about him. What made him tick? So Roderick played to his pride for his homeland, stating the Tears was similar to the North. They just needed some help to achieve the same level of greatness. And when he suggested he would take the mantle of General and Ash would serve him, the former Archon was furious. Until he looked to his soldiers and understood. You see, Roderick was closely working with that faction. He bled for their battles and looked out for their best interests. While Graven Ash hunkered down in Iron Hearth, he loved his soldiers, and that compassion led him to an action. Besides the Aegis, he wasn't doing anything for them. The confrontation was decided by Law 9. Winning through action, not argument. The game offered the perfect dialogue option for this moment. Look at your troops, Ash. You are their father, but I am their commander. Hmm? This moment offered an insanely satisfying payoff. I've played games where you talk down a final boss, but never one to talk one down into taking his position, making his army as my own with his counsel. I felt like the Chamberlain at his best, cunning, practical, and yes, evil. And that gratification kept lingering. Tunan called Roderick to court, where he argued his case for his actions in the tears, on the other side of the position, with another making a judgment of him. The game offers multiple choices to explain your justifications, and even taking the accounts of your allies as witnesses. There's a choice to have a regular boss fight against the Abjunicator, but a verbal debate felt like a more satisfying way of clashing with the Archon of Justice. And the moment Tunon made his verdict, concluding that my fate binder was innocent, every action had a worthy logic and justification to back them up. I felt a greater sense of victory than any combat encounter in the game. It was a payoff for taking Kairos' laws and the role of a cunning villain seriously. After accepting the former Archon's pledge of service and dealing with Kairos' executioner bleed and mark, I had one last decision. Kairos assumes I'm getting too big for my britches and sends their army to the tears and I am given two choices, assert my claim of the Spires, or conclude Kairos' conquest. Asserting my own power may sound like the best option, but being at the top results in those below trying to claw for my position. So Roderick proudly proclaimed his glory for the Overlord, with his position established and fulfilling the first law of power, never outshine the master, for it was the Overlord that conquered the tears. All Roderick did was act as their sword, Glory to Kairos. Tyranny is one of the most satisfying RPG experiences I've had in a while. Video games can be so many things, and RPGs in particular can allow us to see the world from a new perspective. I never found this type of game to be really interesting for their builds or having the numbers go up, but rather their skill of immersing the player with its setting and characters, to take them seriously and offering a vehicle to engage with their ideas. Tyranny is a wonderful example that there are plenty of interesting roles that aren't being the hero, and in engaging with it, we can self-examine what being evil truly means, and realize we are more capable in committing it than we'd like to think, even with the best of intentions. If you ever wanted to play a game built around exploring evil as a concept, Tyranny is worth a shot. I'll leave the Steam link in this video's description. This YouTube channel is called Polymacho, and thanks a whole bunch for watching. This is a longer one, but I hope you got some enjoyment out of it. Subscribe if you'd like to see some more cool stuff, drink plenty of water, and I'll see you around. Take care.